गुड मॉर्निंग डी स्टूडेंट्स इन दिस सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स वी विल टेक अप एक्ट फाइव ऑफ एज यू लाइक इट सीन फर्स्ट द फिफ्थ एक्ट बिगिन्स ऑन ए कॉमिक नॉट टच स्टोन कंटिन्यूज इज इम्पिचुअस वूइंग ऑफ जेंटल ऑर्ट्री ऑर्ट्री इज अपरेंटली सम वॉट अनोयड at the sudden end of their marriage plans she regarded oliver martext to be good enough for her she wonders what has happened to atchstone's matrimonial ideas they are soon joined by a country young man named william this young man has been in love with audrey he soon becomes the butt of Touchstone's wit. William has little hope of prevailing against Touchstone's sophisticated tongue. When faced with poison, the bastinado or steel, as alternatives to his leaving, he most prudently decides to leave. After William's dismissal, Audrey and Touchstone are again left alone. However. their privacy is only of momentary duration soon after william's departure corin enters he informs that he informs them that ganymede and eliana request their company in another part of the forest now scene second the scene is still in the forest the characters however have changed we see orlando and oliver discussing a new development in the plot oliver has fallen instantly in love with elena he has resolved to give over all his property and land to orlando he says that he will spend the rest of his life as a shepherd in the forest of arden dedicating himself to the simple life and to his love for elena Orlando is understandably incredulous. Is it possible that on so little acquaintance you should like her? That but seeing you should love her and loving woo and wooing she should grant and will you persevere to enjoy her? After Oliver has announced his intention Orlando and deceived his brothers they are interrupted by Rosalind's entrance Rosalind and Orlando exchange dialogue which is appropriate to the role of courtly love that they have been acting out Rosalind speaks oh my dear Orlando how it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf Orlando it's my arm Rosalind I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of the lion Orlando wounded it is but with the eyes of a lady In this dialogue both the characters Rosalind and Orlando choose to express themselves with the courtly exaggeration of Elizabethan lovers only a little while ago Rosalind was heard mocking the idea that lovers might die for love Now she chooses to speak of wounded hearts and to accept the pretty conceit that Orlando's wound comes not from the claws of a lion but from their from fair Rosalind's eyes Perhaps Rosalind's mockery has been modified by Celia's sudden love for Oliver at any rate she discusses this romance with Orlando at some length she expresses surprise at the suddenness of the passion but she accepts its strength orlando informs her that oliver and celia are to marry the next day he uses this as an occasion to express his own misery he is no longer content to imagine that ganymede is rosalind he wishes to find his real love just as oliver has done 
After hearing Hollander's laments about his own unhappiness in contrast to Oliver and Celia, Joy Rosalind as Ganymede makes a sudden prediction. What she predicts? Believe then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have, since I was three years old, conversed with a magician most profound in his art and yet not damnable. If you do love Rosalind so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Eleanor, shall you marry her? I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible to me. If it appear not inconvenient to you to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human, tomorrow human, as she is, and without any danger. Orlando is understandably surprised, but he is willing to accept the prediction since it satisfied his satisfies his longings. Longings. Just after Rosalind's encouraging promise to Orlando, Silvius and Phoebe enter the scene. Phoebe protests to Ganymede, accusing him of treating her ungently. Rosalind answers her as brusquely as before indicating that she does she does so for Phoebe's own benefit rather than for the sake of being unpleasant. The four speak of their thoroughly confusing emotion. The scene becomes a kind of loud chant. Finally, Rosalind rebels, comparing their noise to the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. As the scene concludes, she takes the situation in hand commanding Phoebe and Silvius to meet her at the same place tomorrow. To Phoebe, Silvius speaks, I will marry you if ever I marry woman and I will be married tomorrow. To Orlando, I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man and you shall be married tomorrow. To Silvius, I will content you if what please what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. To Orlando. As you love Rosalind, meet Silvius. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I will meet. So fair you will. Everybody promises to do the bidding of their magical Ganymede. The scene ends on a note of confused hilarity, which promises to become, a rap become rapidly resolved. Now, scene third starts. In this scene, the action can, uh, focuses on Touchstone and Audrey, who still demands demand some surety that her lover's original promise of marriage is to be carried out. Touchstone assures her that they, like everyone else in this convenial forest, will be permanently joined tomorrow. They are then joined by two of the Duke's pages. Who contribute a happy song for this happy occasion. The tune, It Was a Lover and His Lass, is certainly suited to the situation. Among other things, it's impossible to take seriously a love which is celebrated with a hey and a ho and a hey nomino. The song is followed by some puning between touches on and the pages and the scene ends. Now scene 4 starts. The previous scene was brief and relatively quiet. This scene which concludes the play draws all the major characters onto the stage. The first to enter are the banished duke with the Amiens and Jakes, Orlando, Oliver and Celia follow close behind. The Duke questions Orlando about Ganymede's magical promises. Orlando seems convinced that they will come true, but he realizes that much of his optimism stems from his ardent desire to have things work out as they were predicted. The men are soon joined by Rosalind with Silvius and Phoebe. Rosalind 
renews her questioning of the com company. She asks her father if he will indeed allow Rosalind to wed Orlando. The Duke promises that he will. Orlando promises that he will marry her happily. Then Phoebe and Silvius are questioned. Phoebe promises that if she refuses to marry Ganymede, she will without further ado consent to marry the much scorned Silvius. And Silvius happily consents to this bargain. Rosalind sum summarizes the promises made by various lovers. Then she leaves for the deeper part of the forest with Celia. At her departure, the banished duke has a hint as to the outcome of the play. He remarks that Ganymede reminds him of Rosalind. Orlando agrees that he too had marked the similarity. The two men com comment on this strange coincidence. Now, Touchstone and Audrey also arrive, enter the scene. They, they also see enter the scene. JX finds the appropriate ironic comparison, commenting that with all these paired couples, it looks like the scene at the boarding of the Noah's Ark. JX and Touchstone continue their verbal sparring. JX accuses the clown of having been a courtier, a challenge which Touchstone accepts as a compliment and defends loudly. The Mask The conclusion of the play here begins to assume the form of a mask. The mask is the elaborate court entertainment in which people represent abstractions. Rosalind and Celia are escorted back to the stage by, by Hymen, the god of marriage. He sings of the, of the mirth in heaven when earthly things are made even and presents Rosalind no longer disguised to the rejoicing duke, her father. Rosalind gives herself to her father and then to Orlando. They rejoice and the surprised Phoebe says, If sight and shape be true, why then, my love, adieu? Hymen sings another song as he escorts the lovers to their marriage ceremonies, and everyone seems content with his lot. As the happy couples sing the praises of happy marriage and love, they are joined by an unexpected figure, Orlando and Oliver's other brother, J.X. D. Boyd, is usurped onto the scene. He speaks in summary, account, accounting for his own presence and indicating the conclusion of this action. I am the second son of the old Sir Roland that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, hearing how, uh, how that every day men of great worth is restored to his forest, addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword, and to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where meeting with an old religious man, after some question with him, was converted, both from enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished father, brother, and all their lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. The Duke is properly pleased to hear of the news of his brother's change of heart. He vows that all his faithful courtiers who followed him to the forest will share in his new good fortune just as they had shared his old troubles. He bids the company to fall into rustic revelry commands the music to begin and the four sets of brides and bridegrooms enjoys the merriment. The melancholy Jakes, the only one left to be taken care of here is the melancholy Jakes. When Jakes learns that Duke Frederick has retired to live the life of a hermit, he decides to join him. He cannot face the thought of a return to the gaudy pompous court, but would rather continue to live in the forest. 
he gives the semblance assemblies his dubious blessings to dupe you to your farmer former owner i bequeath you your patience and your virtue well deserve it to orlando you to a love that your true faith doth merit to oliver you to your land and love and great allies to silvius you to a long and well deserved bed to touchstone and you to wrangling for thy loving boys is but for two months victual so to your pleasures i am for other than for dancing measures so saying he takes his leave as the rest of the company continues to dance appropriately enough rosalind gets the last word in the play after the end of the action she returns to the stage to speak directly to the audience she speaks ironically of love men and women and advises both men and women to seize to seize love where they find it that's all for today and have a nice day and with this your act gets over